All right, let's get to one of my favorite things. So we are, the whole chapter is de dedicated to speciation. So that's pretty much it though. Well, I'll give you the essential questions in a second, but we are defining a species and we're looking at the mechanisms of speciation. How we make new species. So defining a species, we'll start with that. And on this one, I'll give you our essential questions. Oh, this is not gonna work, hold up. A noisy phone and a messed up kind of laptop situation. Now we're good to go. All right, so essential question, what is a species? And that will be, oh boy, let's see. Let's try spelling. So that'll be our first part is defining a species. Our second one that we'll get to, as you can kind of see from the beginning, is our second question will be, um, what are the mechanisms of speciation? So we can write it here. So what makes it happen? Oh my god, I did it again. Speciation. Ah, what makes it go? What? How do we get new species? How does that all happen? What makes it do what it does? So just to define species before we can talk about how we make new ones, we get the idea of microevolution being the change of the gene pool of a population from one generation to the next. Speciation is the process by which one species is splits into two or more species. So this is our major thing here. Process by which one species splits into two or more. That's the whole, like that's chapter 14. <laughs> so make sure you know what that means. Each time speciation occurs, the diversity of life increases. Okay, so we get more species when we make more species. Isn't that fun? Okay, the word species is actually Latin for kind or appearance. So you could think, you know, species specific, it's kind of of the same kind of thing. Appearance doesn't always work, but the same kind or maybe type. Although the basic idea of species are distinct life forms seems intuitive, Devising a more formal definition is not easy, and it raises a whole lot more questions than it answers. Okay, in many cases, the differences between two species are obvious. In other cases, the differences between two species are not so obvious. Oh boy, we had to do a... So if we look at some of my insects that are in the room, um, and those aren't so bad, but we had to do a whole big collection for an insect taxonomy class. And I tell you, I tried to stay away from flies because flies are like a thousand species and every one of them looks the same. And some of them, the defining characteristic is like, well, on this part of the fly, it has two little hairs and on this fly, it has one. I'm like, are you, are you making this up? Because this is stupid. But I'm serious. It's not all that obvious. Even these two little guys are an example. These are definitely different species, although they look pretty similar. They're doppelgangers. They look pretty, pretty close. Okay, so how similar are members of the same species? So how do we make this distinction? Even though these two dudes back here look very, very similar, but are of different species, how do we define this? How are they similar? So whereas the individuals of many species exhibit fairly limited variation in physical appearance, certain species, are, like our own, for example, are really varied. So some look the same, some don't, okay? So here's an example of humans. Definitely a lot of variation here. So what we go with, and there's a couple of other concepts. So if you look in the book, uh, at some point there are some other species concepts but we could look at, but this is the more traditional method that we go with. This is kind of the, the more widely used definition for species, but the biological species concept defines a species as a group of, in, of words, a species is a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed in nature and produce fertile offspring. 
So offspring that themselves can reproduce, because we, that's the whole point of biology is that babies need to make other babies in the future and make more, so that way that species perpetuates. Otherwise, you end new species, right? So basically the, the ability to interbreed is the major thing in the biological species concept. So members of the biological species are united by being reproductively compatible, at least potentially, even if it, you know, they never cross paths or whatever, the potential is there to mate, okay? So there are several ways that we can go about this, but there is reproductive isolation. These things prevent genetic exchange or gene flow and maintain the boundaries between species. But there are some pairs of clearly distinct species that do occasionally interbreed. So um, sometimes we get these things called hybrids. Um, so an example is a um, when a grizzly bear and a polar bear who are two different species mate, they make these things called roller bears, the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> there are also a couple of examples. Um, Oh God, where, no, no, where's my brain? It's the, it's the mule, I think it's the mule. I brain fart on that one. The mule or donkey thing, it's one of those. And the other is a liger, one of our favorites, all right. So here's a grizzly bear, here's a polar bear, and here's a roller bear. I don't know, it just doesn't, he needs a hug, but he doesn't look right. All right, so there are other instances in which applying the biological species concept is problematic. So it sounds obvious, it's like that totally makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily always. So there's no way to determine whether organisms that are now known only through fossils were able to interbreed. Kind of can't observe that. So hard to tell with fossils. Reproductive isolation does not apply to prokaryotes, oh my god, or other species that uh, reproduce asexually. So notice that's a problem there as well. So we have some alternative species concepts. I may have listed them like there's a morphological species concept. Morphological is just based on appearance, just in case you hear the word again. Oh well, that's my cursive went crazy on me. Um, so observable physical traits. So we could use those for fossils and asexual um, organisms. But there's some subjectivity, so it's not always clear. There's also ecological species concept. It's just by its ecological niche, so where it kind of fits in with the, uh, the environment. Two species of similar appearance, but distinguishable based on what they eat or what depth of water they're usually found, something like that. You don't have to know the ecological or morphological species concept. There is also a phylogenetic one. So we will talk about phylogenetic trees. You don't have to know a whole lot of details about these. Um, this one, so phylogenies are just the smallest group of individuals that share a common ancestor. So that's coming up when we look at taxonomy stuff. Uh, because we're going to actually build these things called phylogenetic trees. So it, it's just based on the smallest group that would share a common ancestor. And those are kind of distinguished based on their appearance, their DNA, and then also what kind of weird biochemical pathways. But we'll, we'll, we, can, we can revisit that later. So agreeing on the amount of difference required to establish separate species is still kind of a... Okay. Like most of science, there's still a lot of wiggle room. Okay, there's the last thing that I'll kind of mention here before we move forward, but there are some reproductive barriers, and these serve to isolate gene pools of species and prevent in interbreeding, so that way kind of keep species separate. I'm going to mess up species apparently every time I write it. I'm just going to accept it, get ready for it, it's going to be SPI every time. <laughs> okay, so some species separation. So these depend on whether they function before or after the zygotes form. So just to review, we have egg and we have sperm and they meet, and when they do meet and fuse together, that is the zygote. 
So we're talking about uh, whether that's before the egg and the sperm meet or after the egg and the sperm meet. So pre and post. Some very useful prefixes. All right. So before we get into the list of each of these, I think it would be a good time for you guys to take a break. Um, maybe chunk the notes, go back and look at what you have, write a summary or write a couple of questions out to the side and then come back. So five types of prezygotic barriers. So these things prevent mating or fertilization between species. So it's before a zygote can ever be formed. We have habitat isolation, and this is a lack of opportunity for mates to en encounter each other. That's like, it reminds me of that movie, it was, I think it's Ever After, it's like, a bird may love a fish, signore, but where would they live? And that's actually, that's a habitat isolation. If a bird lives in, in the sea, or a bird, <laughs> get it backwards. All right, if a fish lives in the sea and a bird lives in the sky, those are two habitats that won't ever meet and it just won't happen. Okay, so that's habitat isolation. It also can just be as simple as one lives in the tree and one lives on, underground, but they, they can live like feet from each other, but still it's just not gonna happen. We also have temporal isolation. So temp is based on kind of seasons or time, think like tempo or what some things like that. It's, we're talking about time. So they breed at different times. If a certain go, uh, animal goes into heat and spring and another goes in fall, well, they're never going to be able to reproduce because they're in different seasons. Okay, so some examples. Here's habitat isolation. So this garter snake uh, lives mainly in water, uh, and this one lives on land. So even if these are two garter snakes that are really closely related to each other, they're still never going to mate because they just aren't on the same kind of in the same habitat, in the same place. Temporal isolation, breeding at different times. So again, we've got a different, pretty closely related skunks, but this one breeds in the late winter and this one breeds in the fall. So they're just not, they're not going to meet no, no matter how closely related. Okay, so three, four, and five, we also have behavioral isolations. There's a failure to send or receive appropriate signals. Um, oh God, oh. The spiders are hilarious about this. They're notorious, especially jumping spiders. If the male doesn't do the correct dance that she is looking for, she'll just eat them and they'll be dead. So <laughs> the thing is, is a male has to do the appropriate behaviors or it's not going to work out. And that's happened. If the wrong species gets the wrong species of female, she's just like, well, you're not any good for your own species. So I'm, I'm doing your species a favor. <laughs> The attitude in the spider community, I do believe. All right, but behavioral, if they're just not sending or receiving the right signals. We also have mechanical isolation, uh, physical in incompatibility of repro reproductive parts. So basically the parts don't fit, it's not gonna work, okay? We also have gametic isolation. So there's a molecular incompatibility of the egg and sperm or the pollen and stigma. So they just don't molecularly match. Okay. So behavioral things, uh, some good examples are with blue-footed boobies or mass boobies. They do different rituals, different courtship dances, and so that they're, they're just not going to work. Uh, mechanical isolation, this also works for um, like heliconia. For example, this is a type of plant. It can only be pollinated by hummingbirds uh, with short straight bills. And the same goes here, so, or with longer bells. So it really has to, everything has to match up properly. Gametic isolation. So these guys really tend to just um, put egg and sperm out into the water. But even if they were to meet in the water, they don't, they're chemically incompatible. So it just doesn't work. Okay. So get some examples. Some postzygotic barriers, so after a zygote has already formed, so these are typically where we have our hybrids. What happens with hybrids? So there's a re reduced hybrid viability, so the interaction of parental genes impairs the hybrid development or survival. So it's just, um, it's like not as healthy. 
not as healthy, not as strong, just kind of maybe puny and something. Uh, reduced hybrid fertility is usually the one that we see, so they are not, uh, um, they're, they're healthy, but they just don't produce babies. They just can't, so there's no babies happening here. And you can't perpetuate a species without being able to reproduce and make uh, other babies. If that works, though, because there is a thing called hybrid breakdown, so if the hybrids are viable, so they are healthy, so they're healthy, and they're fertile, so now they're making babies, but the babies that they do me make are kind of like weak or they don't make babies. If it ends the, if it ends the line soon afterwards, that's hybrid breakdown, okay? So hybrid viability, we're going to talk about these guys, these salamanders, these newts. Um, they just don't fully develop. They have really, they're not viable. They, the little guys they do make get eaten. It's just not, no, no bueno. Okay, reduced hybrid fertility is the mule. I did have it right. Okay, the mule is a donkey horse hybrid. So it's really, it's a strong thing. It's like, it's awesome but it can't make its own babies. So I'm never gonna make them. Okay, and then this one just shows some rice that would do the same thing. So the rice is fine, it produces you know, healthy offspring, but eventually the offspring of that offspring will produce kind of just puny plants. Okay, so these are the kind of uh, prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. So let's say we haven't done one in a while. Um, yeah. You know what? Let's do an Easter egg for this one. So write down the prezygotic and the postzygotic barriers, and just uh, yeah, just write down those. You might want to define them or give a little, you know, particularly maybe for some of the postzygotic barriers, they're weird. So you might want to define those. And these have really nice um, short definitions. So maybe you get some of these things and copy that down on a separate sheet and turn it in and maybe you get some extra points on your, on your, uh, what is that, your quiz. That's the next thing that we have, the quiz. Let's do that. Mechanisms of speciation. So we're moving forward here. We're going to try to make this quick. So a key event in the origin of a new species is the separation of populations from other populations of the same species. So this gene pool isolated, the splinter population can follow its own evolutionary course. That's sort of what we looked at in the video. So changes in allele frequencies caused by natural selection, genetic drift, and mutation will not di be diluted by alleles entering from other populations, gene flow. So we have a couple of speciations. So there's allopatric speciation. This is an initial block to a gene flow that may come from a geographic barrier. So allopatric is really just geographic. So this is like a mountain range. Okay? That's all allopatric is. Oh boy, there's like a river that came through it. Though even allopatric speciation can be from human stuff. So if we do decide in some areas to build a wall, well, maybe that wall does actually serve as an allopatric speciation to different animals on either side. So just something to think about on that one. Humans play a large role in that, even a road or something like that. So several geological processes can isolate populations. A mountain range can emerge and gradually split populations. So this, again, these things are over a long time. Okay, a large lake may subside, and there's several smaller lakes isolating fish populations. Continents themselves split, so that whole Pangea thing. The allopatric speciation can also occur when individuals colonize a remote area and become geographically isolated on their own. So kind of like the founder's effect. So that's kind of the idea there. It's sort of like founder's effect. All right, so how large must a geographic barrier be to keep an allopatric species apart? The answer depends on the ability of the organism to move. So it depends on the organisms themselves. Birds, mountain lions, coyotes can all kind of cross mountain ranges, no big deal. But in contrast, we've got small rodents that find a canyon or a wide river an actual barrier, you know. 
So the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River is separated two species of antelope squirrels, and they are the cutest little guys, but they are different species. Look how cute they are. It's <laughs> probably why I like this section so much, because there's lots of cute things. Okay. So how do reproductive barriers arise? So the uh, environment of an isolated population may include different food sources, different types of pollinators. We've got maybe different predators. So a result of natural selection acting on those pre-existing variations, because remember, they can only be pre-existing um, unless we get some genetic drift or mutations, a population's traits may change in ways that also establish reproductive barriers. So we just this is how we continue speciation. This is how it happens. So researchers have successfully documented the evolution of reproductive isolation with laboratory experiments. And these studies have included laboratory studies of fruit flies. We use fruit flies for everything. And field studies of monkey flowers and their pollinators. Okay. So the idea is that like we had an initial population, and then so this is an example of allopatric because we're doing geographic, different geographic barriers. You have your initial ones, and I give them starch medium over here, and we're separated kind of bottled geographically. And they're given maltose, so a different type of sugar over here. And then we see what happens as they mate and how many males and females that we end up getting um, kind of as we split population. So even, the point is, is even when we split them among these two things, as we might... We get all kinds of crazy things happening. You know, population one, population two. They're getting a little weird over there. But none, nonetheless, those things are going to be different because we're giving them different selective pressures and we've separated them by jars so they can't get through the glass and get to each other. That's the basic thing. I'm not going to get into all the details. Here's the monkey flowers. They do some different things. They have some different pre-existing colors and... And that affects them. Here's the real tricky one, though, and this one's a rough one to get through, but we're going to try to just get the basic idea, and if you really just have a definition here, I'm good. Uh, we'll get a couple of examples, but it's a tough one. So there's a thing called sympatric speciation. So this occurs when they're in the same geographic area. So this is not, um, not geographic. So, like, the mountain thing, not here. They're actually in the same area. Okay. So how can reproductive isolation develop when members of sympatric populations remain in contact with each other? Well, gene flow between populations can be reduced by what's called polyploidy. So remember, poly is many, and ploid is number of chromosomes. So this is more of, like, with plants is you may have certain versions of plants that have multiple, multiple copies of chromosomes, and they won't be able to reproduce properly with the older, kind of, or the fewer generations. So that's just one. It's just some, it's chromosomal stuff. It's some chromosomal copies that make it an issue. We also have habitat differentiation. We'll talk about that one in a minute. And also sexual selection. So it's just, you know, what ladies, typically the ladies prefer. That can cause some species differences. Okay? So hopefully that makes some sense. We'll do quick here. But um, many plant species have originated from sympatric speciation when accidents during cell division give extra sets of chromosomes. Plants are really great at handling this. Animals just can't. New species formed in this way are polyploid and that their cells have more than two complete sets of chromosomes. And they're good with that. Um, so just a little connection here. Plant biologists estimate that 80% of all living plant species are descendants from ancestors that form from polyploid. Hybridization between two species accounts for most of these species. However, because of the adaptive advantage of the diverse genes of hybrid inherits, from different parental species. So we do get some hybridization in there. So some polyploids that we know of include cotton, oats, potatoes, bananas, peanuts, barley, wheat, coffee, my favorite, sugar cane, apples, and plums. So lots of things that we eat are polyploid. Okay, we need some wheat. Okay, wheat has been domestic domesticated for a long time and it's a polyploid with 42 chromosomes. 
I meant to get to the other things, but at least you have some examples. We'll be good with that. We're trying to get this thing finished up. So one other thing here as far as uh, isolated islands are showcases of speciation. So this is a good example. So isolated island chains are often inhabited by unique collections of species. That's that whole think about um, Darwin and the Galapagos. So islands that have physically diverse habitats and that are far enough apart to permit populations to evolve in isolation, but close enough to allow occasional dispersions to occur from other sites, often have multiple speciations events. So a little kind of close enough to let other crap come over, but far enough that like they don't want to go back, right? So the evolution of many diverse species from a common ancestor is really known as adaptive radiation. Because we start with one common ancestor. Here, I'll make it a smiley face. Here's our common ancestor, but as things move to different islands, well, they change a little bit. I don't know. Wee! <laughs> but that's the kind of adaptive radiation. As we're moving to different islands, we have different, different things that come up. If that sort of makes any sense by my silly faces there. Uh, an example is the Galapagos, so it's located um, west of Ecuador. It's one of the greatest showcases of adaptive radiation. It was formed from these naked underwater volcanoes from five to one million years ago. Um, think like Hawaii, it's kind of similar things. It was colonized gradually from other islands in South America mainland, as many species of plants and anima animals that you can't find anywhere else. So they currently have 14 species of the closely related finches. Those are Darwin's finches uh, because he collected them while he was on the be beagle. So these birds share finch-like traits, differ in their feeding habits and their beaks, and specialize for what they eat. And those arose through adaptive radiation. So they had kind of a starting point, and then they changed as they kind of moved out and had different selective pressures on different islands. So this one maybe is a selective pressure that it could eat cactus, cacti. This one had to use some tools, but it worked there. This one got better advantage at seeds on that island. So although they're similar, they had some different pressures on each island. So we can see speciation occurring. The species living today represent a snapshot, a brief instant. The environment continues to change, sometimes rapidly due to human impact, and natural selection continues to act on affected populations. So researchers have documented at least two dozen cases in which populations are diverging as they exploit different uh, food resources and breed in different habitats. We'll give you an example of that when we talk about these kind of newts or salamander guys. They're a pretty, they're an example of speciation that kind of happening sort of right now. It's, over time it's happened, but th there's a great visual on it, I promise. Sexual selection is a form of natural selection in which individuals with certain traits are more likely to obtain mates. Bowerbirds are a lovely example of this. They're adorable. I don't know. Oh, I took the picture off, but they're so funny. Okay, so basically they just make these big kind of towery things, bowers, and they try to attract females by, look how pretty this thing is. Just, it's great. So what happens when separated populations that are related to each other come back in contact? Again, the newts are going to be a great example for this one that I show you. So we try to answer this by studying what we call hybrid zones. And this is uh, areas in which members of different zones meet. I'm trying to finish, I promise. So, so let's say we have these small populations, and these are just showing that the individuals are moving back and forth. But something happens. These guys move off over here, maybe it's to one island, maybe it's to another. But over time, the island, so maybe the, the water has gone down a little bit, so we had an island here, and we had an island here. But somehow the water receded just a little bit, so now, oh, I'm zoomed in for no reason. I love my computer. <laughs> so now there's actually a... Like, the water's receded, and now there's a thing in between them. So now these things can actually go back to each other. Well, that's what we call a hybrid zone, where those hybrid individuals would be at. And so it just depends on what occurs as to whether those will be, whether it will, let's see, reinforcement. 
Well, it will reinforce it. So natural selection to strengthen or reinforce those reproductive barriers, thus forming unfit hybrids. So this uh, makes, makes the species. Okay, so the barriers between species should be stronger where the species overlap. Uh, the closely related flycatcher and pied flycatcher um, are an example of reinforcement. Oh, I got the species right on that one. We're almost done. All right, so they're kind of an example of where, where those things can, whether it's allopatric or sympatric, what happened. Fusion is what happens at that reproductive barrier, so between species that are not strong enough and the species come into contact. Well, the gene flow can occur um, and they can kind of fuse back to being one species. And this occurred, so this is an example is occurring in the cichlid species in Lake Victoria, it's another type of fish. Oh, there's two models. All right, we're at 30 minutes. I don't want to do too much. You can read about these. There are two models of the tempo of speciation. Actually, we could do it real quick. Okay, so there's a thing called punctuated equilibria, and it just says that species change the most as they arrive, and then they change relatively little for the rest of, the rest of their existence. So it's like lots of change, no change. Maybe later on lots of change and then no change. So it's kind of punctuated when all this change happens. Other species appears to evolve more gradually. So this is the other model that it just gradually changes in species. The time interval uh, that arises can be a few thousand years to tens of millions of years. It just depends. But here's punctuated equilibrium. It just says here's one, we change the two new ones, and then they stay the same for a long time. The gradual pattern says that maybe there were these subtle changes that happened over time for us to arise at new species. Okay, I'm sorry. I know that is a long lecture, but do the best that you can. Get as much as you, you can out of it, and then if you have any questions, come talk to me. We'll get it figured out. Or you.